So this is um, uh, going to be a talk on a children's book illustration, but a lot of the things that I'm going to go over could apply to any uh, discipline, whether you're doing children's books or animation or just telling, uh, creating a story that you want to tell a story in. Uh, these are my top 12 tip tips for creating more dynamic children's book characters, but uh, basically these are the things we're going to go over. We're going to go over facial characteristics, creating a more expressive line, emotion through color, value, motion, story arc perspective, props, painting the edge, texture and weight and paint, composition, and when to break the rules. Uh, let's start first with facial characteristics. Okay, when I begin sketching, uh, and this is more true with animals than I would say people, an animal's nose is very, nose and mouth are very important to me, probably the nose more than anything. And if you think about it, when a, when a dog meets you, he doesn't really size you up with his, his eyes, he uses his nose to feel you out. So animals, uh, the nose is very important, probably more so than any other feature. So when I start drawing, I always start drawing with the nose. And I'm going to do a demo of, um, we'll do a different animal, but I'm just breaking down some of the important characteristics. Now, the second most character, important characteristic would be the eyes, but not really the eyes. It's really more the eyebrows. And hope, I hope you can see my pointer right there. But uh, that organ, obviously animals don't have eyebrows. So what we do is we create a motion through that muscle right there, that cave. And you'll see a lot of my animals, when um, they look disgruntled, will have these heavy eyelids. And uh, you can see emotion coming through the eyebrows and even underneath the eyelids. This is a sketch for uh, Little Boney. It's in the uh, book called The Ruckus Royals. And I uh, eventually decided on him giving sort of this you know, dubious look to Napoleon. And the original is right here. But right now, I'm working on a cat book. So we are going to go through how to break down drawing a simple cat with more characteristics. And I'm going to open up Painter for that. OK. So when I begin a, a picture, I usually start with some of my favorite pencil drawings. Um, my favorite pencil uh, tools in Painter First, I begin with the real B2 pencil. And let's just quickly go over how that, uh, that pencil interacts. You don't want red, let's use black. Now, the real 2B pencil is a very thin, thin mark. It does have some grain in it. If I increase this, I'll actually get less of that bumpy look. And I need to zoom in so you can see it. It creates a very smooth line. And I use it for my initial sketching. The next pencil line that I switch to is the grainy variable pencil. And I use that. You can see the grain in there. Let me zoom in so you can really see the texture. It looks pixelated when you zoom in that close. But it, I use that pencil line to create more of a thicker line to go over my sketches. But the first things first, let's pull up some cat references. Now, this is a, a book on a cat who, um, he wants to play the harpsichord, and he can't because his owner won't let him on it. Let me create a new picture. Okay, so you see I have all my cat references, my favorite, favorite um, facial characteristics. I liked this guy because he had sort of that, you know, really, am I stuck in a children's book sort of look? And I'm dating myself, but Morris the cat was a cat that I grew up with and loved, and he was the spokesperson for Nine Lives. I chose this cat because I loved the way his figure was sort of weighted to the ground. And I also try to make sure that my cats, my animals take on human characteristics. So I used, I'm using this one as a reference because I love the way he stood up like a human. Now, I will say one caveat as far as using photos for uh, references. A photo can capture sort of a very awkward moment, so you have to be careful. I actually have a cat, so I was able to study that cat pretty much in detail before and take many, many sketches before beginning my sketch. All right, so I'm going to pick my 2B pencil. I'm actually going to use this guy right here as my reference to start 
because I like the way he's about to pounce. Now the the picture book has both a cat and a mouse in it, and the cat and the mouse are, are sort of against each other at several points in the story, sort of a Tom and Jerry um, type of cat and mouse story. And I like how this cat has, well, you can see he's really weighted in his back legs, and cats tend to, uh, well, a lot of mammals have a lot of power from their back legs. Now, this is going to be very light, and I'm sure you're going to have a hard time seeing it at first, but I will go over it in darker lines so that you can see it. So we're breaking it down into simple shapes. And so I'm drawing a very simple cylinder. And like I said earlier, the nose is very important. Mammals do feel out their, real, their world through their nose. Their, their nose is far more sensitive than our nose. That's not to say that the eyes aren't important, but the nose is especially important. Now with this cat, he's got a sort of come up, comeuppance to him, so he's going to have a very long aquiline nose. Now if I was drawing a real cat, his eyes would be much farther down. I'm actually going to draw his eyebrows first. But on this cat, he, like I said, he's got a very, very long nose. So he has got that sort of almost an aristocratic look to him. And I'll draw just a circle right here. That will be his face. And he's going to be looking down and the eyebrows right here. And he's actually, I think I'm going to have him looking down at a mouse. So he's, again, going to have that sort of furrowed eyebrows. But actually, let's put in his ears next. His ears are very curious and pointed forward. And I don't want him to look too mean. So I'm going to have like a lot of rounded shapes because rounded shapes will generally look more approaching than uh, sharp. And actually, I think I'm going to have him smiling a bit and move this up. Now, I want you to do an exercise for me why I'm drawing this right now. I want you to place your hand on your cheekbone, on the top of your cheekbone, and smile, and then frown. And you'll notice when you do that that your cheekbones, they raise. So it's very important when drawing any sort of characteristic char characteristics on an animal that the cheekbones raise with the mouth, and also that the eyes raise with the mouth. I'm getting that mouth just right. OK. All right, so that's my general uh, shaped face. And now I'm going to slowly map out his body. Now remember that cats, um, and I can see this in the skeleton, cats have a very curved spine. So I know just from looking at that skeleton, and this is why it's important to study skeletons. And again, I'm not making a realistic picture. I, I'm going to be exaggerating it somewhat. But this, there is a curve to this. And when we're drawing, we always want to have a continuous line of motion. And what I mean by that is that everything is affected from the, his back weight of his legs, which is, carries most of his weight. There's a, mo a movement in a line that goes down to his eyes. He's going to be looking right about there. So back legs, very important. I want to really feel like there's a weight on his back legs. And um, when I'm drawing animals, especially when it's a book that has both animals and uh, people in it, the owner of this cat, he's got a sort of a big bum. And I purposely drew him that way because the way that uh, the book takes place in the 18th century, and the, if you study anything about clothing, the way men's breeches are, they, you always tuck in the shirt into the breeches. And that makes for a very big bottomed look. And um, you know how they say animals end up looking like their owners? Well, I want to relate the two people together. Um, the owner's name is Scarlatti, and the cat's name is Chinilla. I'm gonna, this mouse is going to be looking up right about here. Oh, no. I'm not going to spend a lot of time drawing the mouse because we're focusing on the cat. OK. So again, continuous line of motion. And I actually, I'm going to draw that in red so you can see what I mean. This line goes up and around and back around to his paw. 
I'm actually going to make that. Now you'll notice on here, his paw actually ends right outside his ear. I'm going to exaggerate the length of his paw, because remember, we're not trying to draw like a super realistic picture of a cat. We're only trying to draw a cat that has a certain, so he's looking down, so he's going to have, his eyebrows are going to be looking down at the mouse. And his eyes are kind of mad, but his smile says something else. And that's often a characteristic I will use, with, especially with cats, is that I will have one, emo one uh, area saying one emotion and another area saying another emotion. And he's sort of looking incredulously at this mouse. Now, the chest is very important, too, because a cat's chest is strong. Uh, especially with bigger cats, if you're drawing like a leopard or something, uh, that chest area, it sort of uh, branches out like a barrel. Okay, so I have the general weight of how I want my cat to go, and we're not, again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the mouse, maybe we'll give him a few threatening claws. And at this point, I'm going to switch to my grainy variable pencil because I want to get my lines in a lot darker. Let me, okay. So I, again, I don't want too much realism, but I want it to resemble a cat. So I am going to draw like a cat-like nose. And he's sort of in a half smile. And you know, when, if there's going to be a half smile, then that means this eye is going to be more closed than this eye. Because his face is sort of twisted up. Okay, so I'm definitely going to raise this side of his mouth more because of what we just did in that cheek exercise. The cheekbone would be raised more in this side. Yes, I am using a Cintiq. And he's got sort of small ears. His ears are not. Whenever I'm drawing uh, any sort of character, I always make sure that um, I don't let other features over-dominate the one feature that I'm trying to focus on. And with Puccinella, which is his name, his dominant feature is A, his eyes, and B, his very long aquiline nose, because he's an aristocratic cat. Okay, now very important is whiskers. Because with whiskers, I can again show that ability to, and this eye is probably a little too far over here, but I am spreading them out. And the reason why I'm giving him these very almond-shaped eyes is because I view that as um, something an aristocratic cat would have. Now, as I drew this, and this is why I love digital painting, I realize this eye is too low. Easy fix. We can move that up. Perfect. And that's something I can't do with traditional painting. So it allows me to sort of um, uh, treat it like clay, where I can mold everything. Oops, let me open my layers. i got to close you for a second. I can't see. I'm going to collapse these layers because when I moved it up, it created a layer above it. I'm going to drop that down. And his smile is really important, so I'm going to stress that right. Okay, that's about what I want his smile to be. He doesn't know, is he going to pounce? He's amused by this little mouse that's going to be right here. He doesn't know if he's angered by him, which is the eyebrows right here, or if he's going to let him live. And it's kind of like how a cat will, will treat a mouse when he first sees him. Uh, Cats often will chase mice not because they uh, want to eat them, but because they want to play with them. And if you've ever watched a cat play with the mouse, then you know that um, they derive great pleasure out of toying with the mouse before they pounce on them. Okay, so I'm going to move that up just a little bit. And there we go. We're at the point where um, I'd probably maybe play around with his eyes a little bit more, but we're starting to, he's, he's got a characteristic. Um, he, 
he reminds me a little bit of the Morris cat, not completely, because I want to make my own uh, unique characteristics in my cat. But he has the feel of a, he's a cat, but he's not super realistic cat. And we definitely have uh, this weight feeling back here. Now, another tool I use is the Divine Proportion tool. And I use that. I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. And we can move it around, too, when we select it. Because a curve is very important, this spiral curve. It tells me whether all the action is within my divine proportion. And for those of you not familiar with divine proportion, it's basically the Fibonacci series, where if we break down each one of these boxes, it uh, equals 1.6, 1.6, 1.6, 1.6. And I talk about a little bit about this in my book, Digital Painting for the Complete Beginner. But really, the divine proportion tool puts things in mathematical beauty. And this is something that's been used by Renaissance artists from um, you know, Michelangelo to Leonardo to Raphael. But that tells, me, that tells me that I actually need to move my mouse, because I want all this action to be in this sort of spiral. So I haven't drawn in the mouse yet. And I don't even know if you can see him, because he's very light. But he would actually be looking right up. The mouse would be right about there. And that means that I would need, I'm going to drop that down, I would need to change his pupil make this a little bit I'm going to actually switch my eraser to a hard eraser so I can get that pupil right and oops I want to make sure I have that pencil and so he would be looking right about there. Now, when I would paint him in, I'd get catch lights and all that to make sure that, I mean, this is just a gesture drawing at this point. I have very thick lines, but I want him looking down in this direction, and the mouse would be looking up right there, frozen. Oh, no, I am about to be eaten. And I'd make sure his tail goes around in this spiral, too. And let me turn the spiral off so you can better see what that does. But that keeps your eye moving around the page. And I don't have his, his eye completely looking down because I don't have the pupil right. But what that does is that keeps the eye moving in that beautiful circle around the page. So divine proportion is a tool that I use frequently when I want to make sure that my action is, um, is in that realm. Because it, it's not just, you know, poofara. It really is, will keep your picture pictures um, in that mathematical beauty. And when, it, it, you're, when your picture is in a mathematical beauty, your viewer will actually look longer at it. OK. Uh, do you have any questions at this point? OK, I'm moving on. The next thing that's very important is to show different emotions, especially in a storybook. So we don't want to show just an angry cat about to pounce on every page. And a good writer will write a story so that we don't need to do that. But you will see here's Fulcinella looking very dejected. He wants to play music. Here he's getting, let me close that. Here he's getting wined and dined. He's had his hair done. He's sort of got the smug look. And I created that smug look again through that half grin. And you'll notice that when his smile goes up on this side, the eye is a little uh, larger on this side. Um, I don't know how to zoom back up. There we go. So again, our eyes move too when we smile. So if, you're, uh, if your figure's looking a little uh, awkward with a smile, it could be that you didn't move the eye with the smile. And here is that incredulous look. Here comes the mouse. Is he going to let him live, or is he going to pounce? And again, the smile's going up on this side, so his eye is bigger on this side. And here he is um, finally getting to play on his harpsichord. And this is a point where, um, if I'm stumped, I ask my three-year-old son, honey, what is this cat feeling? And I asked my son this, and he said, mommy, he's taking a poop. So I might have to work more on this one. I don't know. OK, we're moving on to the next area, and that is expressive line. And this is something I struggle with, because I'm more of a painter than I am. Ooh, is my go-to meeting still on? 
do you paint over your pencil sketches or do you use a different layer? Um, I use a different layer on top of my pencil sketches, but I eventually drop them down as I go along. And I, I actually am going to get to that more when we get to the painterly stuff, um, because there's a few layer uh, qualities that you need to have as you paint. So hold off on that question, because we are going to get to it. So here's an example of Arthur Rackham, who is just a brilliant at expressive line. If you, if you feel you struggle with line work like I do, then he is someone definitely to study. You can see the line of action. He has those all around and uh, until she, he grabs her. And Arthur Rackham was able to do this thing where he modeled, it's sort of a hard and soft combination. He models with this very soft sort of tea stained uh, feel, and then he has these hard expressive lines. So I'm working on a book called Digital, uh, Renas The Digital Renaissance, and I'm attempting to try to learn from all these famous, famous masters. So here's my painting of, of the abduction of Persephone, and this is the chapter on Arthur Rackham, which I, honestly I struggle with this chapter probably more than any other chapter in the book because expressive line is not something that comes easy to me. So I start with a pencil sketch. Sometimes I draw directly on my Syntex screen. On, um, and again, my pencil sketches are very rough. It looks like a three-year-old did this sketch. But I'm really just trying to get, the, again, the, uh, the line of motion. And then uh, they completely change once I bring them into Painter, because I'm moving things around with my selection tool. I'm actually more of a sculptor than I am an illustrator, so I tend to um, push and pull things a lot. But the next thing I want to show you is how to get some of those expressive lines using Painter. Okay, we're going to close out our cats for a while. All right. I have a whole palette. Sorry, Tanya, I've got to close you. Uh, I have a whole palette of Arthur Rackham, uh, my favorite Arthur Rackham brushes. And I should actually should show you how to do that because it's one of the, uh, we're going to, diverge for a moment here. It's one of the great uh, characteristics of uh, Painter is that you can organize all your brushes into a million different palettes. And I don't even have all my palettes open. But if you hold and oh, hold the shift key and pull at the same time, you're going to get a custom palette. I can keep holding different brushes and dragging it out into that palette. And then I can go to my organizer and I can rename my palette. And you can see I have, because I'm working on a book that has to do with all different masters, I was able to save all these different palettes um, and bring them up when I needed them. Then you can export them and share them with your friends, or you can import them and borrow them from other, other people, and obviously you can delete. We'll delete that one. Yes. Okay, so I have this whole palette on Arthur Rackham, and I'm going to start with the Thin Smooth Calligraphy pen. And this is a pen I love. I'm going to try turn this, uh, I'm using this brown color. Okay, so you can see, let me hide everything else, you can see that it's creating this uh, very sort of uh, grainy line. There's a little bit of a grain into it. In fact, if I lower that more and change my paper to something that has even more grain, you can see that there's uh, a grain in the pen, which is cool because you want to vary the line. But when I first start out, I don't want any grain in my pen at all. I want it to be a really um, smooth, smooth, smooth line. So I'm going to change my subcategory to flat color. And you saw how that changed. Now, to me, that acts a little bit more like a, a true calligraphy pen. So I use that to um, get those really dark expressive lines. And you'll notice it works just like a calligraphy pen. As I change the angle of my, uh, as I change the tilt of my pen, it um, gets thicker and thinner. Uh, the other brush that I use is, that was a thin, smooth calligraphy pen. The other brush that I use is the calligraphy pen. And this pen is also very cool because it has like this sort of um, feel of when the ink runs a little bit. Uh, but again, I'm going to change this a little bit because I'm not totally happy with that. And I'm going to change the dab profile to medium. You can see it update in the window. So the pointed one, it, it really looks like pointed at the ends. The medium profile, it's like more of a thick, thick pen line. And then I'm going to go into angle, and I'm going to change the expression to velocity. So what that does, let me open up a new, this is looking a little too messy for me to draw. Okay. 
So now that I have it set to velocity, if I draw a really slow, slow line, I get a nice thin line. If I draw a, fat, a fast line, I get a much thicker line. I'm sorry, it's the opposite. If I draw a slow line, I get a, a, a thicker line. If I draw a fast line, I get the, these um, really thin lines at the end. So that to me is important because I want to see I'm drawing really fast. I want it to mimic um, traditional pen and ink. And in traditional pen and ink, pressure is very important also, but you, the speed of your hand as you paint is also very important. So that to me is more like real media. And if I go back to this, you can see some of the thick and thinness of the lines that I got. Okay, I also use this brush in the Scarletti pictures that I just showed you. Um, and you can see how the line, even though I'm painting over my lines, it's still important to get that sort of a thick and thinness in your lines because it tells you where the edges of your paint. And to me, it becomes um, a, a way to map out exactly where the shadow and highlight are. I'm going to go back into my chat window. Uh, any questions about creating expressive lines? Okay. I'm not right now. Great. <laughs> this is so weird not hearing you tell me. Okay. I'm going back into color now. Color is very important. Um, and color can really make or break an illustration. Uh, okay. This is the book for Louisa May's Battle. It's by Kathleen Krell. And Louisa, this is a story about Louisa May Alcott when she became a wartime nurse a Civil War nurse. And um, she goes through this long journey before she gets to the Army barracks. And throughout the story, as she gets there, she's wearing a red cloak. And the red is very important. I'm going to talk a little bit about why using certain colors. I use the red because I want a way to say, stop, look. And red, of course, does that. It's a very expressive color. You will actually eat more if you are surrounded by red. Red will uh, raise your blood pressure. It's the reason why you don't see hospitals painted red. Red is also the color of blood. So there's two things that red that colors can do. Colors have obvious meanings that we all associate them with, but they can also be symbolic. And to me, she throws off this red cloak and enters this world. And you, we can imagine how it would be in the Civil War. There would be blood everywhere. So she almost she throws off one red cloak. And, and tra trades it for another red cloak, and that's basically the blood of the Civil War. Uh, this is a scene where she, she basically lost all her hair. She contracted typhoid fever while she was there. And you'll notice I painted it in almost this vomit green color. It's a very disturbing color. Uh, you can see that I used it along the side of her face. So color can disturb, too. Um, I wanted to get across to the reader that she, you know, you can see from her expression, she's okay with it, but she did lose her health through this experience. And here, um, from this experience, she was able to write a book called Hospital Sketches. And it was her first breakthrough book, and it, of course, led to Little Women. So she's no longer wearing a red cloak in this scene. This is, she's recapturing all her favorite uh, moments. She's wearing blue. Blue is obviously a soothing color. So when we want to convey um, an emotion that's more still or quiet, uh, blues are usually used more. And i got to close you again so I can see. Close you. Okay. Uh, color can also relate to figures. You'll notice that uh, Scarletti is an orange. Well, there's a reason, I mean, not Scarletti, I'm sorry, Pulcinella is an orange. And there's a reason that I chose a, as an orange cat. I could have basically chose any cat. I could have made him a white cat, a gray cat, a black cat. Scar Puccinella is very much connected to this harpsichord, and the harpsichord had to be an orangey-brown color because I, historical accuracy is very important to me, and most of them were this wood color. So color can also link an, uh, an animal to an object, and it also can link two, characteristic, two characters together. You'll notice that I put him in a blue carafe, that's like that necktie, and I also chose to put the mouse wearing blue plaid, and I am going to go over pattern stuff uh, later on too. So color connects, they, they're, they're connected through these blue colors, and of course blue being the opposite of orange, it also allows me to, um, oops, 
It also allows me to get the opposite color so he can pop a little. Um, oh, yellow. Yellow is a color I use a lot too. Van Gogh used a lot of yellow. Yellow is actually one of those colors. It's the easiest color to see. I know you'd probably think red, but it's the reason why fire engines are switching over to yellow because uh, yellow is right in the middle of the color spectrum. So it's the easiest color for our eye to decipher. So there may have been another reason why Van Gogh kept painting uh, everything in yellow. Okay, um, this is the part we're going to talk about applying paint, and I'll answer that question you had about layers. So let me go through the steps of this really quick. Louisa May Alcott, I paint in the um, sergeant brush really quick, laying down color. Again, I move things around. You can see I made her head smaller. I start to use real oils on top of everything to blend the color, and then I flip. And flipping is very important because it helps me see the spatial relationships, and it helps me see whether or not my composition is working. I'm flipping back. And from that, from flipping, I could realize that I, I needed to close her in more. So I'm using a lot of yellows in her skin tone, but I still have some blues along the shadows and the edges because I want her skin to look like it's bathed in light. And I'm going to real quickly show you some of the brushes that I use to create this um, sort of more painterly feel. Okay. I have a palette called Real Oils. And use the pen. Oops. One of my favorite brushes is the Sargent brush. And I love the Sargent brush because it's really a, a, a brush that applies color in a quick, in a, in a fast um, sort of sculptural way. And it's in the artist brush category. But there is something you need to do to adjust it first. You need to go into preferences, brush tracking. Now you might not need to do this if you don't paint really fast, but when I, when I paint these first initial steps, I, my paintbrush is going a mile a minute. So I increase my velocity scale all the way to 100%. And that allows me to get a lot of these, um, see if I paint really slow, I get this thin line. And if I paint fast, I get this really thick line. And that to me is sort of, um, it's more like real paint because we think about when you throw down paint, it's, you're going to get more of a blob of paint versus uh, when you're very slow, you're going to get this thin line. So it's a very expressive way to paint. Another thing I do, um, I don't believe this is the default for it, is I change the jitter. And let me put the jitter back so you can see what that does. So if I have the jitter down really low, it's, you know, it still has a very scraped paint look to it, but it doesn't have those little randomness at the end. Now if I increase it, I get that random feel. Everything in nature is random, so it's very important to have this very blended random feel to my brush. So I use that um, in this stage right here to map in all this initial color. Then I start to refine the color, and I do that on one layer. Then we start to add layers. Okay, so what's very important at this point is that when we hit new layer, I want to pick up the underlying color. So I make sure to check the box for pick up underlying color. And then I am going to switch to my real flat brush. And I'm actually going to do it on the, the picture so you can see it a little better. Okay, uh, let's work on maybe this shadow area. So, okay, so real oils have, um, they have different characteristics. Actually, I'll show you on the white area so you can see it. There's feature, of course, which feature uh, basically takes those little bristle marks and it spreads them out. Let me get a darker color so you can see it. And I will lower the bleed so that it's applying pure paint. Now, I have set color vari variability over here. The default, I think, is something like right there. But I have increased it because this to me is like real paint. Think about when you're picking up paint from your um, uh, your palette, you don't really, it's very hard to pick up a very clean one color. But this allows me, if I, let me blow it out so you can see exactly what it's doing. This is hue, saturation, and value. So if you increase those, you're sort of getting, uh, think of it as a dirty brush. Now if you're the type of painter that when you paint, you like to uh, clean your brush after every single use, which um, I don't, I, I kind of like just to slap on paint. Now, actually, I'm going to increase the bleed. Now, bleed does exactly what it does, what it says it does. Uh, it bleeds the colors onto each other. Now, as I keep my brush down, it's bleeding more and more and more and more and more. 
if I lift it up and apply new paint, then I'm going to get less of a bleed. So I don't really use blender brushes because every brush can act like a blender. And the reason why I don't use blender brushes is because um, I like to have a little bit of paint as I blend. So I'm applying that, this brown color, but I'm also uh, you know, blending my underlining colors together on a new layer because I had that add new color, uh, pick up underlying color. Now, I, would, I don't want to overdo this. This is coarse as a shadow, so uh, it would be a little bit more blended. But that's the way I get uh, start to get some of these gradations. I'm going to open chat. Uh, how do you determine your color palettes? OK, real quick. Um, so I, 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 actually, that's another, another question that you need to save to our value talk, um, which I think I'm moving on to next. Yes, all right, I will answer that in, in a second. OK. Uh, value. Okay, I begin every painting in an underpainting and then apply color on top of it. The, um, this is the chapter on Raphael, which again was a very challenging chapter and I, I, I do not mean to um, assume that I can paint like Raphael, but I was able to learn a lot from studying his techniques. And one of the things I learned is about different underpaintings. This is um, obviously pretty rough, but this would be a Crisai underpainting. And I think some of you probably are more familiar with Crisai because it's used a little bit more. But Crisai is basically called a dead layer. And uh, it's pure black and white. So the, the purpose of doing this underpainting is to get your values right. I know I beat this to death in my last book, but really getting your values right is 80% of a painting. And I don't even spend, as you can see, the difference between, you know, this is very tight. Um, this is very, you know, Renaissance artists created far more tighter value paintings than this. But this allows me to see what the lightest and darkest areas there are. Because if my values are right, applying color this is going to be, you know, it, you know, I've got half the painting accomplished already. So that's Versailles, and that is, and I'm going to try to pronounce this, uh, Auguste Dominique Inglés. <laughs> and I'm sure somebody else can pronounce it a lot, a lot better than I can. But um, he used a lot of this dead layer. So when would you use this? Obviously, this has kind of a goth look to it. You can see the, the tinted color starting to come through. I don't use Grisaille a lot. Um, maybe if I, I would if I was doing a Halloween book or something. I do use the next underpainting technique a lot more, and that's Imprimatura. Now, Imprimatura, Imprimatura was used a lot by the old masters like Leonardo and Raphael. It uses a single layer of sepia tones, and they washed it thinly into the canvas, and then they would basically rub it back with a piece of bread and some linseed oil. And I use, this is the one, the technique that I use for this painting. I tend to use Imprimatura if I'm going to have a very warm color to the skin. And um, if also if I'm going to paint in a way that the, the, her face is coming out of darkness, I will usually use the Imprimatura technique. And here's an example of Adoration of the Magi. It's very cool. Whenever I'm at a museum and I see an unfinished painting, and Leonardo had a lot of them because he was could be kind of a, um, a procrastinator. It's so cool to look at an underpainting. This was um, Leonardo's underpainting, and as you can see, he's using this Im imprimatura layer of sepia tones washed very thinly. You can see the canvas showing through, and then he would build color on top of this. Right? There's a third underpainting technique, and it's the one I use the most if I want, if I'm painting something in the daylight and I want realistic skin tones, and that is Verdaccio. And Verdaccio is sort of a grayish green color, and it marks out the highlights um, in the olive tone, and you use a warmer sepia tone in the shadows. Okay, so old masters, they had a very scientific reason for painting in Verdaccio. When light hits our skin, and I'm, by the way, I'm talking about Caucasian skin, the red wavelengths created from our blood are blocked, and we're left with its opposite color, which is green. So if you ever struggle with getting skin tones right, which I think everybody does, then try painting a, this uh, underpainting in this sort of olive green tone. Oh, and I should clarify that Renaissance painters didn't actually use green. They actually used yellow ochre, a bit of black, white, and a hint of red, um, a red color called cinebreeze. But the end result ends up looking very green. 
and here is an example by Michelangelo, um, he tended to finish his work, so it's kind of hard to see, find a lot of Michelangelo underpaintings, but you can see that he's got this uh, grayish green uh, sort of feel to the background, and then he slowly built up colors. I mean, and look at these skin tones, they're so realistic, I mean, they're, they're just beautiful, and uh, that Verdaccio underpainting certainly helped. So let me uh, answer your question about uh, color. And we will go back to underpaintings. OK, so I'm going to open my color mixer. I'm going to clear my mixer palette. And the way I create a, a Verdaccio, I'm going to have to close you. The way I create a Verdaccio underpainting, and that's the one with the olive green tones, is I create what's called color strings. I'm going to pick, uh, pick my apply color. I'm going to start with, actually, I'm going to start with the lightest. And I'm going down in value. This is called a color string, which anyone who went to any art school, you probably had to do these a million, million times over and over again. And the purpose of them is to get our values right, because we don't want color to interfere with our values. So once I have this color string, I then take my mixer color, and I just mix it. And this is how I would paint traditionally, too. So. Um, this is basically becomes my uh, value study for, I can, now I'm going to switch to the sample color. I will continuously sample these colors as I paint. You can see it changing on the color wheel. And let me make sure that answered your question. Does that answer your question on color mixing? So then uh, once I get that underpainting done, well, let me talk a little bit about that. Okay. This is a good example because it shows a painting that went through some really ugly phases, but I think it eventually got there. So I began in this Verdaccio underpainting, and then I slowly start to add color on top of it. Um, and again, using those real oil brushes that will blend with the underlining value study. And then I start to find my edge a little bit more. Now you can see Louisa May Alcott has this very like pouty, dejected look on her face. And uh, Louisa May was not like that. She was very stoic. And I started to realize, as I read more about her, you can see I'm, um, I'm adding, I added more browns in at the last stage because I wanted it to look sort of like an old Civil War photograph. Um, so I flip. I flip, and I realize, oh, God, her face is terrible. It looks like she's like got, you know, uh, this real pouty face. And I uh, fixed her face. But then I realized I had made a classic mistake. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this in perspective. So this is the most emotional scene in the book. This is the, the point where all these um, wounded soldiers have come in, and she's just got to grab that sponge and go to work. Well, I haven't really zoomed in on the action, because here we're distant. There's another guy in the background who's distracting us from that pivotal moment. And here, as I, you know, I flipped it and I zoomed in, now it becomes a more intimate moment. It's her and this one soldier who's wounded. So um, it's very important that you, you get the emotion of the scene right, and a camera angle can make or break that. Um, we, of course, want to change the camera angle throughout, but we want to make sure that when we want our reader to pay attention, we want to draw our reader into the scene, we zoom in. And this is, of course, something that people in animation do intuitively. But, um, you know, for me, I, didn't, I wasn't really getting this scene correctly. And you can see also, too, in the background, I'm using that sergeant brush. And what that allows me to do is the backgrounds are all, like, very blurry and very painterly. But Louisa May's face is sharp, and so is his. So again, that sergeant brush allows me to really focus on what I want to concentrate on. And this is this intimate moment between this soldier, who is you know, obviously grateful for her attention, and Louisa May, who's just got to roll up her hands and stick her hands in blood. OK, we already talked about that. All right. OK, the next thing we're going to cover. So value. Value is very important. Motion. And how are we doing on time? Ooh, I don't think we're going to cover everything. We'll do our best, though. OK, motion. Uh, this is a painting I love. Um, it's by Giovanni Baldini. And Baldini was called the master of swish. He, um, he was, what he was able to do, as you can see, the fabrics envelope the figure, but it's got like this, this there's motion in the brush stroke. There's nothing to sit still. It looks like she's about to 
to jump up from that seat. And this is very important in a portrait because portraits can be kind of boring um, if they don't have motion in them. Now her face is still, but everything around her is full of motion. Um, so there's a chapter in the book on Baldini, which again, I don't mean to assume that I can paint like Baldini, but it was interesting to try. Oops. Okay. Um, this is a, a, obviously a dancer, but I'm going to show you some of the techniques that I was able to get these very swishy, swishy, swishy brush strokes. And for that, you're going to switch back to painter. Okay. Sorry, hold on one second. I'm losing my... Oh, there it is. I'm going to open up a new well, pieces of paper. I'm going to switch to my Baldini. I'm going to have to close you out again. Okay, uh, one of my favorite brushes is the Loaded Palette Knife. I love this brush because it really does paint like a palette knife. Let me get my color a little bit darker. Okay, um, it has sort of this streaky feel to it, but I do change a lot of some of the settings to it. I change color to color in depth. And this is the impasto menu if you're not familiar with it. And you can, anything that's an um, oil brush, pastel, everything except watercolor, FX effects, and patterns, you can add impasto and weight into your paint. So I'm going to change it to color and depth. I'm actually going to uh, change this to about 4% depth because I don't want the depth too high. And uh, actually, I'm going to put the depth really high so you can see it and you can see what happened. That's, of course, crazy high. Um, actually, when I paint, I change this depth as I paint. That too is a little too crazy high, but I hope you can, I have it up high enough so that you can see it. So I use this brush at about that impasto depth to create these um, really like thick, 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 thick paint as I paint. And then I need to smear it. Actually, let me, um, me first because there would be, the canvas, oops, that's, we'll get to that on patterns. Okay. Actually, let me start a new. new. All right. I just want to make sure I have tons of color so you can really see it smear. Okay, I'll use a posing color. All right, so I have my palette, my loaded palette knife, and I've set the depth to color and depth in about 5%. Then I take my, um, Real Oils Smeary Brush, and I go back to color variability, and I'm going to increase that. Again, a reminder, color variability does just what it sounds. It varies the hue, saturation, and value as I paint. That's probably a little too high. And then I'm going to increase the bleed. And that, and this is an example. I would use this to smear at the edges. This is an example where you really don't need to use, I mean, you can use Blender Brush a little bit if you want to, like, to get some light modeling. But you can see I'm not, I mean, I'll pick green so you can see it. It's not loading with any paint right now. And that's because my bleed is set to 100%. So this would be the equivalent of taking like linseed oil or maybe turpentine and just running it through your brush. And it's wonderful because I can change the feature too to get more bristling marks. But it doesn't, it's not blurring the pixels like say like a blender brush in Photoshop would. It's actually combining the paint um, because I have this pick up underlying color uh, checked right there. So that's a way to get uh, really uh, like these smooth brush strokes. Oh, and one thing I forgot to go over is hair, which is really important. I'm going to switch gears for one second. Okay, when I'm painting hair, I use the real round brush. It's also found in the oils brush category. I increase the feature because again, that sort of spreads the bristles out. I increase the color variability because think about the way hair is. Hair has all these different colors in it. It's never one color. Let me zoom in so you can see that. Increase it a little bit more so you can really see it. But you can see, because I have green underneath, it's almost painting with like a greenish brown uh, streakiness. And this is a great, great brush um, if you're ever drawing any animals with um, bristly hair. If I lower this feature, I can create a smoother brush. That's actually um, 
it's actually a pretty nice like bristly brush, but you can see the color variations and that's due to this color variability. Okay, back to motion. All right, another way we can create motion is of course the old animation technique and that's these little lines here, uh, Tom and Jerry, which I love and I grew up on. And you can see obviously he's getting kicked from those little lines that surround him. Uh, this is uh, Marshall Duchamp and I think it's called Figure Descending a, New Descending a Staircase. And I love this painting because he's repeated the figure and you, I mean, obviously you really do get a sense of motion. And I should mention that motion is really important in children's books because kids like motion. They, I mean, think about a toddler, they don't like to stay still at all. So motion is very important to convey. And I'm going to show you an example of how I wasn't getting that in one of my um, spreads and how it evolved. So here's a, a, a scene in um, Scarletti's Cat where the cat's getting chased all over the place. And yeah, you sort of get a sense of action. I have got the type around, but it's not really, you know, that really frantic action. So I stole a um, secret from Marshall Duchamp and I repeated the figure. And now he's going around and around and around. You're getting falling, 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 falling. You're definitely getting a more sense of action. And then I was looking through a book and I saw this picture. And this is um, Dynamism of a Dog on Leash by Giacomo Bella. And I love this painting. I mean, it's obvious this dog is moving. So he repeated um, it in sort of like this cartoon way, but he repeated the legs moving. And I thought that would be really cool. So now um, it's a little bit blurry because this, um, this screen preview puts it to 72 dpi. But now you really get more of a sense of motion, like all these legs moving and moving and moving and moving and moving, and then boom, stop. He's landed on the harpsichord. So think of a children's books are, are a lot like music too. We have a very, really fast tempo and then they, we have to get to a point where we stop it. Um, oh, this is important too and I, this is something I can discuss really quickly. It's something more for writers but uh, I make these little thumb tabs before I draw anything out. Um, and this is really important to get the arc of my story. What I mean by story arc is on page 14 or 15 or somewhere in the middle, that's where the heat of the action needs to be. And if it's not, if you're, if you're not reaching that arc in the story at that point, and if the writer has done their job, which uh, Nathaniel Eckmeyer did perfectly in this book, uh, you will have that dramatic action in this middle of the book. And this is a scene, I don't know if you can see it from these chicken scratches, but this is a scene where um, Cochinella falls on the harpsichord. So real quickly is just to remember to get the arc of your story right when you're doing your thumbnails out. Um, perspective, oh, I'm not going to talk about that because it's not as important as, uh, I know you guys are going to be more interested in patterns. Okay. I actually already covered this somewhat in another webinar, but I'll, I'll cover it again real quickly because it's, it's so important to really get some historical details in your uh, drawing. So I love patterns in Painter. I, I think everyone knows that. I just create patterns like left and right. And I found this sort of art deco pattern. So all I have to do is make a selection around it. Say, um, oh, sorry, wrong thing. I'm in my patterns library, which I don't have open. Oh, here it is. Okay. All I have to do, make a selection, hit capture pattern. I'm going to keep the rectangle or tile at zero. I'll name it Art Deco. I'll create a new paper. And I, of course, forgot to look where I put that, which library I was in. No, nope, that's not it. Where did you go, Art Deco? Okay, this time I'm going to pay attention to where I put it. <laughs> Capture pattern, Art Deco 2. There it is, right there. Okay, I'm going to select that. Get my pattern pen brush. And now we have a pattern that will go around. I can hit pattern marker if I want a more definite line. Now where would I use this? You ever see like those old, I do a lot of historical books. You ever see like those Renaissance like fabrics? Oh my God, think about that. Someone took like this little detailed pen and actually had to draw, like paint those in. I mean, and now I can just create any sort of 
like I might use that as an edge, but it gets better than that because you have to remember in Painter you you don't have just one pixel of color to make a pattern. You can also use a photograph to create a pattern, and this is a um, actual gold. Oops, I just opened Painter 11 by mistake. Dropped it into the wrong one. This is um, just some lace that I scanned in, and again I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to make a. Actually, I'm going to select all of it. I'm going to make a selection around it. I'm going to hit Capture Pattern. I'll name it uh, Lace Gold. It's appearing right here. And then I'm going to take my pattern marker. Oops, give me my brush tool. Make sure I use Pattern Pen now. All right, so I'm, you can see I'm getting the actual color. I could use the chalk and get it as just one color. So where would I use this? Um, I don't know. Let's use it. Actually, let's use it in this. Create a new layer. My pattern brush is going to get smaller as I make my brush smaller. And I'm doing that on my Cintiq. I'll paint that in along here. I could have painted that a little bit straighter, but that's okay. You get the point. Um, and then I'll change the blend mode. I'll change that to, I don't know, maybe, no, hard light. I don't like overlay. Uh, maybe. Multiply? Yeah, multiply. So um, now that could be a way to get like a little bit of texture into um, some of, you know, some of your fabrics. And I just love playing around with pattern pens. Yeah.